It's one of the saddest moments in all of Star Trek. Outnumbered by Klingons, his son murdered only moments ago, determined to save his friends, including the recently resurrected Spock, James T. Kirk does the unthinkable. He lures his enemies onto his ship, the legendary USS Enterprise, beams himself and his crew to relative safety on the planet below, and watches as the auto-destruct system destroys the Enterprise. As the remnants of the ship burn up in the planet's atmosphere, Kirk looks as though he could cry. I'm sure many people watching this scene in movie theaters back in 1984 felt the same way. And who can blame them? This was the Enterprise. The ship that had carried Kirk and his crew on adventures across the galaxy for almost 20 years. Or maybe for only a few years. Because from a certain point of view, the Enterprise Kirk destroys in Star Trek III is not the same ship as the Enterprise Kirk commands during Star Trek the Original Series. It all depends on how you look at it. And look at it we shall in this video, which I am calling Is the Post-TOS Enterprise Actually a Different Ship? On one level, this is the nerdiest of nerd questions. But on another level, the question leads us to grapple with one of the oldest and most difficult questions in all of philosophy, the nature of identity. What makes a thing the thing that it is? How much can a thing change while still remaining the same thing? Like I said, it's some deep shit. Let's get into it, shall we? The most well-known example of this type of problem is the ship of Theseus. It was described almost 2,000 years ago by the Greek writer Plutarch. According to legend, the great hero Theseus had sailed from his home city of Athens to the island of Crete to rescue a group of young Athenian captives and kill the Minotaur who lived at the center of the labyrinth. After his triumphant return, the grateful Athenians preserved the ship of Theseus as a tribute to the god Apollo. The Athenians were able to keep the ship seaworthy for centuries by swapping out old, rotten wooden planks with new ones as necessary. Eventually, every original plank was replaced. Plutarch writes that the philosophers of Athens began to argue with each other about the ship of Theseus. Some said that it was still the same vessel that had carried the great hero to Crete and back. Others insisted that because none of the original planks remained, the ship now moored in the harbor was a different ship altogether. When Star Trek The Motion Picture premiered in movie theaters in December 1979, Star Trek fans got our own version of the Ship of Theseus problem to argue about. Call it the Ship of Kirk problem. Oh wait, I've got a better one. The Ship of Tiberius. No. The Enterprise on the big screen looked different than it had looked on TV. The general design was still the same. Big flat saucer section, cylindrical engineering section underneath, long narrow warp engines jutting out on either side. But the changes to the ship's interior as well as its exterior were impossible to miss. These changes could easily have been treated as a retcon. In other words, there's no in-story reason why the ship looks different now. It's just that the producers had more money and they wanted to redesign everything so it would look nice up on the big screen. And the characters don't notice the difference. To them, it's always looked this way. That's exactly what the producers and designers of Star Trek Discovery decided to do when they created the look of their show. Many longtime Trek fans were, and still are, upset by the fact that the technology, the uniforms, the appearance of the Klingons, and the overall aesthetic of Discovery is virtually impossible to reconcile with previous Star Trek shows set during roughly the same time period. But those elements aren't meant to be reconciled with previous Star Trek shows. That's what makes it a retcon. There is no explanation in the story for why everything looks different. It's just different. Which, to be fair to the fans who are put off by it, is unusual for Star Trek. Discovery features the most extensive, unexplained cosmetic alterations to the franchise to date. There have been significant changes in the past, like the differences between the looks of TOS and the motion picture, but they've always been given an explanation in the story for why things look different. Except the change in appearance of the Klingons between the original series and the motion picture. That 
wasn't explained for like 25 years, which means for 25 years it was essentially a retcon too. And I liked it better that way, if you want to know the truth. I'm getting off track. In the case of the changes to the Enterprise from the original series to the motion picture, the presence of that in-story explanation, the fact that it's not a retcon, is actually what creates the ship of Theseus problem. The Enterprise looks different when it shows up at the end of Discovery's first season as well, but that's a retcon. It looks different to us, but to the characters in the story, it looks exactly how it's supposed to look. The Enterprise in Star Trek The Motion Picture looks different, but the characters are aware that it didn't always look like this, and there is a reason why it looks different included in the story. We're told that since the end of the original series, the Enterprise has undergone an extensive top-to-bottom refit. We're also told, and the characters in the film seem to accept, that the Enterprise of the motion picture and the Enterprise of the original series are the same ship. But are they? Or is it? However you say that? When we overlay images of the Enterprise before and after the motion picture refit, we can see how extensive the alterations are. As you can see, these are supposed to be of the Enterprise A, but the Enterprise A and the original Enterprise post-refit were identical, on the outside at least, so I'm going with it. By the way, I got these images from the website Ex Astra Scientia, which is the sort of place a Star Trek nerd can fall into and never want to climb out of. Highly recommended if you haven't checked it out. And these images in particular were created by Igor Maric. Igor Maric the bobsledder from Croatia? I have no idea. Maybe. And when we move to the interior of the ship, we see a whole new bridge, a whole new main engineering facility, a new transporter room, a new sick bay, and new corridors. And we're talking about more than cosmetic alterations here, too. At one point, Kirk gets lost and has to ask a crew member for directions. And she's like, the turbo lift is that way, Admiral Dipshit. And then he runs into Decker, looking all smug. And Kirk's like, oh, bite me, proto-Riker. How many godlike beings have you faced? None? How many evil supercomputers have you tricked into destroying themselves? Is that number zero? Thought so. I'm paraphrasing a bit. The point is, it seems as though the ship's interior has been gutted and redesigned and rebuilt. So, if the interior has been completely redone and the exterior has been completely redone, what's left? The frame? If we assume the engineering and saucer sections weren't replaced entirely, but rather extensively remodeled, then I suppose we can assume the ship's original skeleton is still intact, at least for the most part. But is that enough to consider the Enterprise we see in the motion picture to be the same ship we saw in the original series? Philosophers arguing about the ship of Theseus problem have been asking themselves a similar question for thousands of years. Some would argue that the ship retains its original identity because its original components were replaced gradually, meaning the history of the ship doesn't begin with the placing of the last new plank, but can be traced back to the ship as it was before the first plank was replaced. Others would argue that as the original planks were removed and replaced, the ship gradually lost its original identity and must now be regarded as a different ship. One of the most interesting ways to approach this problem is to examine it in terms of what Aristotle called the four causes. Aristotle proposed that before we can claim to have knowledge of a thing, we must understand why it is the way it is. To provide a general framework for seeking that understanding, he offered the four causes. The material cause, what is the thing made of? The formal cause, what is the shape, the arrangement, the appearance of the thing? The efficient cause, how was the thing made? By whom or by what was it made? The final cause, what is the purpose of the thing? What does it do? What was it made for? An Aristotelian solution to the ship of Theseus problem might be to say that it is the same ship even after its last original plank has been replaced, because even though it no longer consists of the same specific material it once did, it does consist of the same kind of material, wood in this case, and even though the replacement planks may not have all been placed by the same people who built the ship the first time, they were placed in the same way, 
and the ship retains its original shape and exists for the same purpose it always has, so same ship. We can apply this same solution to the Enterprise problem. Presumably, the ship after the refit is made of the same kind of materials as it was before the refit. It's in the same general shape, though as noted already, it does look a little different. It was made by the same people, generally speaking, not necessarily the exact same individuals who built the ship originally, but the same organization, Starfleet. And it was made for the same purpose. That last bit might be the most important point in deciding whether or not the refitted Enterprise is still the same ship. Because when we consider the purpose of a thing, we're talking about more than its intended practical function. The refitted Enterprise wasn't intended to be just any starship. Its purpose was to be the Enterprise. Not a new Enterprise. We got plenty of those later on in the franchise. The same Enterprise. By having it undergo a refit, albeit an extensive one, instead of building a whole new ship, Starfleet was able to maintain a tenuous but unbroken thread of continuity from here to here. The identity of an object is determined by more than the planks of which it is made. Identity is a complex and pliant thing, and it's dependent on more factors than we generally acknowledge. Think about our identities as individuals. I might like to think that my identity is rooted in something solid and immutable, but the truth is, it's the sum total of my body, my experiences, my memories and interpretations of those experiences, my inner sense of who I am, the way I'm perceived and treated by others, and lots of other things I have little to no awareness of or control over. Isn't philosophy fun? The same thing is true of the Enterprise. There isn't one essential thing that makes the Enterprise the Enterprise. Its identity is made up of many different ingredients, including the specific materials it's made of, but many other things as well. Its form, its history, its purpose. Now, maybe even after all this, you look at this ship and you say, yeah, but you know what? I don't care if they replaced everything one piece at a time to maintain continuity, and I don't care what Aristotle thought. There's too much new stuff. There's too little of the original ship left. That's not the same ship. And everybody, the characters in the movie, and the audience is just pretending it's the same ship because it makes them feel better. Cynical bastard, aren't you? But from where I sit, that is an equally valid answer to the problem. If there was a single obvious answer that everyone could agree on, it wouldn't be a philosophical question. And it wouldn't be as much fun to talk about. I don't really care if the Enterprise from the motion picture is actually the same ship from the original series, because there actually is no ship. The Enterprise we all know and love was made not by shipwrights and engineers, but by writers, directors, production designers, concept artists, set designers, special effects artists. It exists not in outer space in the 23rd century, but on the screen, on the page, and in our collective imagination. We ask ourselves questions like, is the ship in Star Trek The Motion Picture really the original Enterprise? Or does the transporter kill you? Or how many times does the next generation crew have to save the galaxy before some of these people get promoted for God's sake? We point out contradictions and inconsistencies and invent explanations for them. We ponder the unseen ramifications of the actions of our heroes. We do all of this, hopefully, because it's enjoyable because it enables us to connect with each other, because it reminds us of the ways in which Star Trek is silly and preposterous, but also of the reasons why we love it. And it's not just Star Trek. Is the Flash faster than Superman? Could a lightsaber slice through Captain America's shield? Why didn't Thanos use the power of the Infinity Gauntlet to increase resources instead of killing half the population? Do the answers to these questions even matter as long as we're having a good time arguing about them? Is it really Kirk's original Enterprise? If it's changed so much, Kirk can't even find the elevator? Maybe not. But what about this? Is that the face of someone who just blew up a ship he'd only been on a few times? Or is it the face of someone bidding farewell to an old friend? I leave that judgment to you, you mawkish nerds. <laughs> this concludes my presentation.
Lest anyone think that last line was a bit of a cheap shot, you are looking at a self-identified mawkish nerd sitting right here. I hope everybody enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching this episode of Trek Actually. I'm gonna let you all know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but first, I want to recognize some new patrons of mine. From now on, if you make a pledge to my Patreon of $5 a month or more, I will read out your name at the end of the next Trek Actually video. So here are the new $5 per month or more patrons that I have received since the last episode of Trek Actually. Rachel, thank you, Rachel. Honey Ace 427, thank you, Honey Ace 427. Jennifer Havard, thank you, Jennifer. Elijah Sarver, thank you, Elijah. David Pritchard, thank you, David. Gods of Elf and Man by Nathan A. Klein, thank you, Nathan. And Frank Marlin, thank you, Frank. Now, thanks to everybody who is a patron of this channel at whatever level you are pledging at. If you want to become a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives. I also want to remind everybody that in addition to doing these videos uh, about Star Trek, I am also the co-host of a Star Trek themed podcast called The Ensign's Log. And if you want to know what The Ensign's Log is about, it's a comedy podcast where myself and Jason Harding, uh, who is also the creator of Opinionville here on YouTube, we play characters who are low-ranking junior officers aboard a certain famous exploratory vessel, which is embarking on a certain famous five-year mission. Each of our episodes takes as its starting point an episode of the original Star Trek series, and then we go off in our own direction while the events of that episode have either just happened or are about to happen or are happening sort of in the background of our story. If you like people taking the piss out of Star Trek, but in a loving way, an appreciative way, in a way that you can tell that we're both huge fans of it, please, please check out the Ensign's Log podcast. It is linked in the description of this video. There is a link to the RSS feed, so you can subscribe to it through the podcast app of your choice, or you can listen at the website, lemmelistenpodcasts.com slash The Ensign's Log. Now, next on Trek Actually, I'm going to do a video about one of the most famous and beloved and revered antagonists in all of Star Trek, the Borg. And specifically, who's responsible for ruining the Borg? I'm sure you have your own opinions. You'll find out my opinion in the next Trek Actually video. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.